This is the Colonel Rad Alert. Civil defense information will be broadcast at 640. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Y2K. How can we prepare? Stop a few of their machines and radios. Throw them into darkness for a few hours. We are fighting for our lives. My family must survive. Boom. For five years. Thousand gallons of gas. Air filtration. Water filtration. Coming at you from the frozen tundra that is East Central Alberta, Canada. Streaming live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, Rumble, and Odyssey. Welcome back to the workshop where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. I am Toolman Tim. Today is August the 1st, 2023, and this is episode 347 of Workshop Radio. How is everyone out there? In just a minute, we're going to get to the incredible conversation I just finished up with with James Wesley Rawls. You'll probably know him as the author of Patriots, but he is also an incredible wealth of knowledge and the history in the early days of the internet preparedness and survivalist movement. I hope you guys enjoyed as much as I did. Real quick, two quick announcements. Number one, if you want to support what I do and you like to get cool, embroidered Velcro morale patches every single month, sign up to the Patch of the Month Club at patchofthemonth.co. Last month was uh, zero out of five stars. Government would not recommend. Everybody loved that. And this month, I'm not giving away yet, but people who have got it so far, enjoy it. Ten bucks a month, $100 a year, patchofthemonth.co. Secondly, if you want to know more about the workshop community and you want to become part of our community where you can share your resources, share your knowledge, answer questions and get your questions answered, come by and join the Telegram group. The link for that is in the description below. And guys, with that... Let's get into the conversation I just finished up with Mr. James Wesley Rawls. I hope you guys enjoy it. It was just a breeze of an hour, and I would gladly have him back again. So with that, let's dive in. I did a little digging on you. Always love to to know a little bit about the background. I mean, I've read your books before, but uh, it, I read that you uh, grew up surrounded around ranchers and physicists with a bunch of bomb shelters around. What was that like, and what was your upbringing a bit like? <laughs> Well, it, it was an interesting upbringing. That was in Livermore, California, the home of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. That's where my dad worked. And uh, he was in experimental physics, particle physics, um, and worked with uh, linear accelerators and cyclotrons. Wow. And uh, was more in basic research than designing nuclear weapons. But, of course, the damage studies that they did um, – played directly into creating nuclear weapons components. So uh, indirectly, he was involved in nuclear weapons development. So it was an interesting place to grow up. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was a bunch of ranchers kids and a bunch of physicist kids. And uh, it was a very stimulating environment for a young man. Uh, and Growing up kind of in the shadow of the nuclear bomb, as it were, it certainly gave me an appreciation for the fragility of our society and for the, the threat of nuclear war. Is that kind of where, so where um, where did your passion, I mean, growing up around nuclear bombs or nuclear shelters and that sort of thing, it must have kind of made you uh, at least aware of what was going on. But where did your passion to kind of throw your entire life into preparedness come from? Well, I think actually it dates farther back than that. It dates back to my my pioneer family. Uh, my family came out west by a covered wagon in the 1850s. And that pioneer mentality never really wore off in our family. We've always um, hunted, fished, uh, been very keyed into the outdoors. And... One of my, you know, my parents, both of them, um, grew up in the Great Depression, mm. and that mentality really never wore off on them. They were always very frugal. Um, my mom wasn't into home canning that much, but definitely uh, into home cook, home cooking for just about everything. We didn't do any kind of packaged foods, so. All in all, I think my upbringing kind of steered me toward survivalism, and it was kind of a natural that I ended up writing the things that I did. So who did you, 
did you um did you dig into Mel Stevens or uh, Don or Mel Stevens or anybody like that? Back? Like who were who were kind of the influential I, people? It was more um, Mel Tappan yep. and Jeff Cooper and folks like that that really really motivated me. And that and of course Crescent Kearney. Uh, he was uh, with uh, another national laboratory. He was Oak, with Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and he's the one that uh, co-produced or co-authored the n- book Nuclear War Survival Skills. Oh, OK. Have, have you ever met? Did you ever have the opportunity to meet him or no? No, actually, um, the only really prominent prepper uh, that I've ever had a chance to meet is a science fiction writer by the name of Dean Ng. Uh, he's from Southwestern Oregon. Uh, he was a friend of Mel Tappan's. And um, he wrote a, a number of books with survival themes. Um, one was called um, Pulling Through, which was a nuclear war survival novel. So uh, I was more indirectly inspired rather than directly inspired by those survivalist writers sure i i love digging into them i've been kind of doing my best to pick up a few uh like kurt saxon um he had the survivor yeah. newsletter that got uh so there's compendiums of them that were released i think in maybe the yeah. early 80s yeah. have you seen those yeah yeah oh, have i seen i have the whole oh, sorry time. yeah <laughs> yeah, oh, dude, good for you. <laughs> my, my influences although you know he was a he was a racist and i i can yeah. never abide by that but other than that i thought that he was a very interesting very creative guy and uh he dug into 19th century technology he liked going through the old uh formularies from the 1800s about do-it-yourself recipes for chemistry and for making your own soap and making your own medicines and that kind of thing and that definitely inspired me as well he, it's a, uh, it's interesting. I, it's tough because are you, are you a believer in being able to separate a like a person's teachings from some of their other teaching? Like you mentioned about Kurt Sachs and having kind of, you know how they love to use the word problematic nowadays, yeah. of course. But <laughs> you know, I, I, I would never have associated with him socially, sure. but I certainly benefited from factual stuff that he put out. I just kind of ignored his writings that were racist or quasi-racist. I think you can divide that. Anyone who has discernment Mm. can kind of pick and choose. Um, There are so many people in the world that have good things to offer, but that also have aspects of their personal lives or philosophies or or even religions uh, that are just way out there and that I would never have anything to do with. So it's just a matter of having that level of discernment. And I would just warn all your listeners, be perceptive about people. Hmm. Look at not just what they say, not what, not even, not, not even just what they do, but the, the long-term, effects of what they do and if you if you look at people from that perspective like when you're evaluating any whether you're evaluating a movie star or a politician or your local mayor it's it's it really pays to be discerning of of people that's one thing i picked up in the intelligence community is to never take anything at face value or Hmm. anything that anyone says at face value you really have to look at the long-term effects and also look at you know allegiances and alliances you know i'm going to jump around just a little bit because that your thoughts they're really kind of so okay i've I've, for about a year now i've been digging into the history of modern preparedness it just i I was laying in bed one night and I started doing some searching on the old Usenet groups and I was I realized how new of a term prepper actually was. Yeah. Now I went through <laughs> this is going to sound funny, but I went through a very short existential crisis for just a little bit because I saw all these people worried about all these things 
that either never came to fruition or they were still worrying about. And just for a short period of time, I kind of questioned why, why exactly am I prepping or being in the preparedness mindset? And how do you, how do you look at the, cause you talk about the long-term uh, thoughts or the long-term fruits of a person's labor. How do you, how do you look at that and keep prepping? Do you know what I mean? Well, it can be discouraging sometimes, but there's also some very confirming events that come along, mm. like Hurricane Katrina, for example, or the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes. All the preps that I made really paid off with that pandemic. Um, you know, obviously, I didn't need to break out my dosimeter and rate me. <laughs> sure. But, uh, all my food storage, all the cleaning supplies all the do-it-yourself stuff that we had squared away allowed us to basically hunker down and lock our gate. So even if the COVID pandemic had been as bad as it was originally advertised, where they said it might have a 20% lethality rate, that's what we were originally told. Yes. Uh, if it had been that bad, we could have simply locked our gate and stayed home for three years or longer, possibly. But we, we have enough storage food here at our ranch for three years uh, without even anything from our garden or any livestock or any fish from our river. So it's it's gratifying to see that there are some confirming events, but it's discouraging sometimes to see that some of my preps have been around so long since I've been at this for more than four years. You know, I literally had to feed to our livestock. Mm no longer fit for human consumption. So, um, but beyond that, uh, I think overall, I feel fully justified or perhaps vindicated in being a, a prepper or survivalist. I kind of use those terms interchangeably because a lot of what we've done has simply saved us money. By <laughs> buying food in bulk, we've saved a tremendous amount of money over the years. Uh, if you if you buy a rice in a one pound package, you're paying literally ten times as much as you pay pay uh, buying it in a, a fifty pound sack. So those kind of so cost savings are uh, really add up in the long run. That, no, I thank you, Jim. That, that's the answer I was looking for because that's what I came. You know, that was the understanding after a few days of thinking about it. Was, it really does make a person's life better whether something really bad happens or doesn't because like you said you were you were set for right the, and the, it, yeah it goes beyond tangible or monetary gain hmm. it's also the lifestyle gain i decided early on that i wasn't going to pursue uh, the management track as a technical writer because i knew i wanted to work from home and i wasn't going to pursue being an army officer long term to to round out my 20 years uh, to retirement because uh, I resigned my commission ju just seven years in okay. as a captain. I didn't end up getting deployed uh, for either the Gulf War or for the umpteen deployments that I would have had uh, if I stayed in uh, through the global war on terror. So there's an intangible there. The other tremendous intangible is the fact that by moving to the country, I was able to raise my kids, homeschool mm. them, give them fresh water, a tremendously nutritious food that we grew ourselves from our gardens and raised our own livestock so we knew exactly what was in that meat. So there's an advantage there. I am very proud of the way that uh, my kids grew up. And they all were raised quite solid, as my grandfather would have said. And <laughs> I'm very proud of them. And I think my choice of where I raised them and how much time I was able to spend with them since I was self-employed really shows. Absolutely. I, I'm a big proponent of, uh, in, in my pillars of preparedness, entrepreneurship is one of them. So I, I love hearing that. But <laughs> um, so... I know this is something you spoke of your ranch, and I know you're private about its location, but I, I did notice where you listed your location is Galt's Gulch. Ha, do, do you feel like you found your own personal Galt's Gulch? 
Yeah, to an extent. All, all of our neighbors are very like minded. And I could literally, as I said before, lock the gate and <laughs> live very self-sufficiently for an extended period of time. You know, after maybe 10 years, we, we might run out of salt or something but or kerosene that essentially we could live truly off grid for a, a very long uh, period of time. So that's something that I can point to as a plus. Uh, I, and in terms of a, a gulching kind of culture <laughs> where I live uh, in the American Redoubt, pretty much everyone around me it lives self-sufficiently or fairly self-sufficiently. Everybody has a garden. Everybody cuts their own firewood. Almost everybody hunts. Nearly everybody has a big gun collection. Almost everybody uh, fishes for trout uh, or uh, landlocked salmon, kokanee. Mm -hmm. And um, almost everybody picks huckleberries every summer and service berries. So it's a fairly self, self-sufficient, self self-reliant kind of community. And the whole attitude that goes along with that matches. Uh, everybody is, is very much into barter and charity. It, it doesn't matter if you don't make a lot of money. Everybody gets along very well, whether you make $20,000 a year or $200,000 a year. We're all just neighbors. We know we all have to depend on each other because we live in a very remote area. If somebody needs you know, to pick up a prescription in town or go shopping for somebody who's ill, uh, you know, we we don't hesitate at all. Uh, we're always looking out for our neighbors. And the same goes, you know, wintertime when people need to get plowed out or if somebody slides into a ditch and needs to get towed out. Uh, or, you know, barn raising kind of activities, we all pitch in. Nice. I I just I just did a show recently on, I don't know if you follow it much, but over in South Africa, the really bad uh, power outage crisis as they've been having. In there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I just kind of became aware of it in the last few months. And as I was prepping the show, all I could think about was the... Uh, how how much it compares to what Ayn Rand had to say or kind of what her vision of collapse was. Do you see any, um, you know, um, parallels between what she had to write when she wrote it and kind of what we're living through today? Sure. Um, certainly we're living in the age of big government, intrusive government. I like to call the modern era the age of deception, deception and betrayal. Uh, that's what we're really living through. You know, 30 years ago, I was warning about a slow slide scenario mm-hmm. and around us. That's exactly what we're living through, at least in the big cities where they have, you know, rampant uh, crime, drug use, homelessness. Yeah. Just to see the, the homeless tent encampments that stretch on for block after block after block in so many cities. It really does look something out of Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Absolutely. I was I was so excited when I saw that listing. I was like, oh, I can ask him about Rand a little bit because there's you know, only so many uh, people you interview that are uh, at least somewhat well versed in her stuff. So that thank you. <laughs> so. All right. I brought you on because I, I have a couple of kind of passions or interests. And one, of course, is the history of modern preparedness. I've kind of I'm doing my best to trace it from the civil defense era to you know modern preparedness and for some reason i'm also a geek when it comes to vintage technology uh you know that's one of my things and i'm not really sure why but it is and i came across a throwaway line i think it was even on wikipedia talking about the early bbs's and usenet groups for um prepping and so i wanted to i wanted to pick your brain because i've been trying to find someone who at least has some experience with them so do you do you remember what are you, kind of your yeah, earliest I, memories? Yeah, I didn't use I didn't use bulletin board systems, BBSs, but I okay. was quite active with Usenet. Um, first in the 19, late 1980s, when I was with Daisix Corporation, which is the the spinoff of the of the earlier Daisy Cadnetics Corporation. Okay, it uh, had access to what was called Fidonet, and Fidonet 
was a way to log into Usenet. And Usenet had a whole bunch of different groups. Um, they're kind of analogous to the user forums that they have on websites now. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is, they're all thread driven. Uh, they're all, um, some are moderated, some are not. So it's very much like a modern forum. But it was in Usenet that we created terms like Tiatwaki mm-hmm. that hadn't existed before or, or Get Out of Dodge, which is uh, one that I helped pop- popularize. Um, and in fact, I was, uh, well, it had already been used as a phrase. I think I was the one who, uh, at the suggestion of a buddy of mine, uh, turned it into an acronym, G-O-O-D, Get Out of Dodge. Um, but those terms really didn't exist before Usenet. And most of those cropped up in um, Usenet in the 1980s. I was a lurker of Usenet in the, 19, in the late 80s. And then I was a poster to use, Usenet in the late 1990s and the early 2000s. And there, uh, I was mainly involved in a few forums. One was rec.guns, that's R-E-C dot G-U-N-S, rec.guns. Another was talk.politics.guns. And the main one was uh, one called miss.survivalism, which was miscellaneous, M-I-S-C dot survivalism. And it was there that a lot of these, you know, the whole bug out bag culture kind of developed uh, the whole uh, modern stance on preparedness. It was kind of an outgrowth of Don Stevens and Mel Tappan and all those folks kind of crystallized down. And then it was given kind of a high tech spin, especially in the late 1990s with the the worries about Y2K. Yes. And then for Y2K, I was selected by Gary North to moderate a couple of his forums. Really? Uh, yeah. So, wow. Okay. So Gary had me moderate a couple of forums, and uh, I think there were like 20 different forums. Um, and... You know, it was nothing fancy. It was I had no official title. I was just a, uh, a volunteer moderator, but I got to dive in and <laughs> got to pour some water on some flame wars. But, uh, it was it was a lot of fun, and that was a direct outgrowth of Usenet as well. A lot of people who were on Mist Survivalism moved over to Gary North's Y2K forums, and by the way, those. Those Y2K forums are actually all archived. Uh, And even now that Gary North has passed away, I think they're still available if you want to go back through any of those threads. And they they were very interesting. Some of them, of course, were alarmist. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I think in part because there was so much interest from the Internet on Y2K, it actually drove a lot of companies to actually mitigate and remediate the, the, the Y2K date rollover problems that they otherwise would have had. They poured millions of dollars into remediation for the, the two-digit date problem that they wouldn't, other, wouldn't have otherwise. And I think it was one of those, um, you know, they talk about a self-fulfilling prophecy. In this case, yeah. It it was a self mitigating prophecy. Sure. So where did you? Uh, that's another kind of one of my um, interests. I was nineteen, so I was a sophomore in university when I remember it happening. And it, you know, I, I I didn't quite grab the whole gravity of it at the time. But looking back on it, are you a are you a firm believer in we solved we we dealt with the issue ahead of time, or are you in the other camp of it was a nothing burger and no, it was it was definitely had some some considerable uh, problems that could have been created, especially in the banking sector. Mm. There were a lot of old COBOL programmers who were pulled out of mothballs to go fix some of that code, and uh, maybe they should have added one 
one more digit uh, to the to the date problem because in the year ninety nine ninety nine they may have the same problem all over again. <laughs> That's good. What was Gary North's thoughts post Y two K? Do you know much at all of where where, where he kind of landed I, after that? I never met Gary face to face. Uh, we just corresponded. Uh, he was a very kindly man and a very godly man, of course. Uh, he also is one of the most generous people I have ever met. He put all of his books uh, for the Institute for Create uh, for Christian Economics. Uh, it's, uh, ICE okay. and his ICE books books website. He turned his entire library of books, basically his entire life's worth work, into um, a free library that's wow. still available now. Now, uh, thankfully, a lot of that was endowed by uh, one of his benefactors, but he had the foresight and the the kindness and the generosity to make all those books available free, including all of his economics books. Um, the one book that I think everyone should read that is absolutely timeless is his book, Christian Economics. But um, Gary, Gary was quite concerned about Y2K. He was one of the first folks to really ring the alarm bell on it. And he didn't, and he wasn't just an alarmist. He wanted to, um, protect his own family. He moved his own family to a a big uh, farm, I think it was in Tennessee or Kentucky, uh, that had natural gas wells, and he had everything set up for natural gas, heating his house, running generators, everything. Uh, uh, all of his hot water was provided with by nat natural gas, and it was all off of local wellhead pressure. There was no compressors involved at all. Uh, right from his own property. So he practiced what he preached. And again, he set up these white forums and he got a lot of people squared away. And a lot of that preparedness carried people through all the way to things like Hurricane Katrina uh, years later. That's incredible. So I, I, I we, we both, uh, I think maybe before we started recording, chatted about how we both dug into the Usenet archives. And so I, the earliest post I could find of yours was February 7th, 1992 in rec.guns. And okay. it was, let me see, I want, I'm going to read it to you. It'll be fun. It, it was nothing. Anyway, it said, um, in the answer to your questions on 45 mags, there are only two types that I recommend. Original U.S. government issue. Usually they have a federal contract number and the original cult. And then you said the vast majority of aftermarket magazines are not worth buying. They have lousy quality control and on it goes from there. Do you still feel that way? 30? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And, <laughs> I, I, I didn't realize I, I had posted that early. I thought I started posting in the late 90s because I, I, I mainly lurked in uh, rec.guns and talk.politics.guns and miscellaneous.survivalism. Uh, in the in the late 80s, early 90s, I didn't really start posting a lot until the late 90s. And that was more promotion for what originally was a shareware novel uh, called Triple Ot and later called or the gray 90s and Triple Ot. Uh, and that later became was expanded to become my first full length uh, novel, which was called Patriots. Um, that's why I got involved in actually posting on Usenet. Uh, was more to promote uh, those books. So yeah, it was it was it was fun. It was interesting. It was a, a very freewheeling exchange of ideas. Uh, if anyone thought that someone was trying to pull a fast one or was being self promotional, uh, they got shot down very quickly. So you had to be very careful what you posted. And there were notorious flame wars that developed in a lot of the Usenet forums. Uh, some of the forums were way out there. I mean, they had, you know, talks about like oh ev everything, like even like sexual fetishes and fantasies and all that stuff. Um, and the, I stuck to the, the, you know the more practical forums, and I tried to just put in my two cents worth hmm. where I had where I could share my knowledge. Um, one of the other early posts I had was uh, I helped co-author 
a uh, foreign ammunition box translation uh, page. It was an FAQ page, a frequently asked questions page uh, that went through Spanish, German, um, a bunch of different languages. I, I helped with the Spanish and German part um, translating foreign ammo boxes. And then I, I was one of the folks that posted a, uh, a chart of non-corrosive dates for U.S. military ammunition. You know, I, I try to keep it practical for people. And then, of course, I, I was the main author of a FAQ on pre-1899 guns that just kind of kept growing. And it kind of became a standard reference for the Internet. It still is. It's funny because people, we, uh, I guess, you know, people kind of younger than myself just kind of take for granted that that stuff's always been out there, but it all had to be developed from somewhere. Yeah. You know, somebody had to take the time to key it all in. That, that was the main main thing in those days. Uh, there was not, you know, optical character reading. Right. Was very rudimentary at the time. And um and text to voice was also very, or, or, or voice to text was also very rudimentary in those days. In fact, voice to text really didn't exist until the 90s, really. So, or late 90s. So it was a lot of it was very laborious keying all this stuff in by hand. So I learned something uh, putting together today's show. I didn't, uh, I always love looking at kind of where. Uh, the genesis of a book comes from and I, i've always known it as patriots but i discovered that it had multiple names including the gray 90s which i'm right. going to guess was a play on the phrase the gay 90s was it or right. was that not yes yeah, okay got play on that the main character's name is is his family name is gray okay i, I thought that was pretty ingenious so <laughs> um, so okay i'm a i'm a stephen king fan i have been for years and i remember in 2000 he made a big deal out of putting out riding the bullet as an ebook and they're like oh he's a groundbreaker and i realized doing this you were five years ahead of him with your uh with your gray 90s how did that shareware experiment come about it, it actually, i just kind of thought it up and did it i saw what people were doing with with software okay we're putting some pretty useful little they didn't even call them apps in those days little applications uh out as shareware and if someone liked them and used them they were encouraged to just mail the guy a $5 bill. I thought, well, I've got this novel manuscript. I can't find an agent. I can't find a publisher. I'll just put it out as shareware. So I kind of came up with the idea. I had the first shareware novel. And because Usenet was such a small community in those days, and because there were very few free ebooks out there, there you know, there were people who had um, taken like, like old 19th century and earlier poetry and keyed it in and made it available. But I think I was the, one of the first people, or maybe the first, to put a whole full-length novel out as shareware. I put it up a chapter at a time originally. And then at the bottom of each chapter, I just put a little note that said, are you still reading? <laughs> if so, please consider mailing me a $5 bill. I gave my address. And I didn't think much would happen with that, but in the long run, the popularity of that shareware novel ended up getting me an agent and getting me a publisher, and that's where everything took off from there. So I'm very thankful that uh, people took the time to download my novel. They critiqued, they, they critiqued it mercilessly. Uh, <laughs> they, if nothing else, they caught a lot of typos. Um, in the long run, we, we ended up having 70,000 people download that novel. Wow. And this was in the early days of, of the Internet. We, there, there really wasn't much of a public Internet at all, except America Online had just kind of been created. Um, and uh, I ended up having my novel get downloaded so many times in those days that the data limits were really tight in terms of how much bandwidth you could use. So on Fidonet, it was kind of pushing the upper end, edge of the envelope in terms of what people could download. And, you know, in those days, people were like logging in after 7 p.m. when the phone rates. <laughs> and they were they were downloading this novel at 1200 baht. Right. So to download each chapter of the novel would take about 10 minutes. 
Did uh, I don't know if you've ever said or if you even remember, but did very many people send you a five dollar bill in the mail? Oh, no. I, in fact, I, I had people sending me money even after my the paperback edition of Patriots was out. Even three or four years later, I was still getting five dollar checks in the mail because pirated copies of uh, even though I'd, I, I had taken the novel down, pirated copies of my novel were still floating around with that address. And I was still getting checks in the mail from people or five dollar bills or five five dollar Canadian uh, bills. Yeah, that that went on for quite a while. And, and one kind of funny aside, I also used to sell a lot of magazines and things at gun shows. Oh. And I would have copies of my book sitting there as well. And I would have people just walk up to me, recognize me, hand me a five dollar bill, not say a word and walk away. <laughs> and the other other dealers at the tables next to me were like, Jim, what's your secret? People just handing you money. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I, call, I refer to that as guiltware because it, you know, it was shareware, but with a delay and people realized, oh, yeah, I should have ponied up years ago. And they just would hand me a five dollar bill. So were you did you have your own website for that or I, I might have missed that or did you post no, that I in one of the forums? I didn't have my own website originally. Um, there was a, a guy by the name of Ammon Campbell who was nice enough to, to create the very first site. And then there were, I think, six different mirror sites on three different continents uh, where people could download the book. Wow. And so, that was the, the original 28. I sorry. The original original manuscript was 19 chapters. Then it was 27 chapters, and then eventually that grew into the 33 chapter version of Patriots. I, I want to come back to the evolution of the book a little bit, but I just wanted to. You mentioned AOL, and uh, if you couldn't tell by my accent, I'm a Canadian, so we didn't have at least early on, I never had an experience with AOL. I worked at a local library and taught people how to use the internet, but AOL just wasn't a thing. But I found this post from 96 and it said, uh, tonight, Wednesday, May 22nd, 96, uh, from 10 till midnight, there'll be a live chat on survivalism with Jim Rawls on AOL uh, keyword Periscope in the chat room, the grassy knoll. Do you, I thought that was really cool. Do you, I, yeah, I wish that, those, that, yeah, go ahead. That chat was not audio, that was text. And I was type. I can remember that particular session because some of these guys must have been typing 200 words a minute. And here I was plodding along at 35 words per minute. And I think I was frustrating people because my responses were so slow and people were flinging questions at me left and right. And that, I, I still remember that particular chat. And yeah, if you did that through Usenet, the other thing you'll see is an announcement for a I had just had a speech in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, the summer before, in the summer of 2000, in September of 2001, on September 13th, 2001, I was supposed to give a lecture at a local NRA meeting. They were going to fly me down to Southern California to give a speech on preparedness and wow. firearms for preparedness. I had to cancel that speech because 9-11 attacks occurred and they grounded all the flights. But you, if you go back through um, Miss Dot Survivalism, you can see my announcement for that that I made right around the 6th, the 7th of September, 2001, saying, yeah, I'll be there on the 13th of September. Uh, but that never happened. The whole world changed, hey? Yeah, it sure did. And I think uh, the, the terror attacks of 2001 also, I think, were a good confirmation for survivors mm. in terms of the the vulnerability of the United States and its infrastructure. So let's slide back just a little on the book because I'll I when I of course I go through the Wayback Machine. Do you ever use that the Internet Time yeah. Machine? Yeah. yeah. So I, I did some digging and some of the earliest references for your book had a copyright of 1990. Was that right or was that a misprint? Is that when you first started? No, no, that think? was um, that that was I wrote that book. The winter of 1990, 1991, as I was pounding nails, building my first house in Idaho, near Orofino, Idaho. So I went ahead and copyrighted it 1990. That makes sense. So, yeah. So uh, and it first went out as shareware in late 1991 or early 1992. 
And then, so how long did it take you to release? Did you have the whole thing written when you were releasing chapter by chapter or did you? Oh, yeah, I, I had written the first 19 chapters when I first started releasing chapters. Okay. And then it got up to 27 chapters, I think, by the time it all went out on Usenet. And then a, a Christian publisher in Lafayette, Louisiana, named Huntington House, noticed the success of that shareware novel and they said they wanted to do a paperback version and by then i had expanded it to 32 32 or 33 chapters and uh, they picked up it in paperback and then officially that was in 1998 i took down the shareware version although again uh, copies are still floating around it's gonna say nothing ever really comes down off the internet does it no that in fact what you mentioned a Wayback Machine, uh, all your listeners should be aware that in the age of the internet, everything you say, every email you send, uh, even every site that you visit is recorded somewhere. It's there for posterity or for legal purposes. So be careful, folks. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> and not good, but... Uh, um so I don't think are any of the AOL chat. I don't think any of them have been archived anywhere, have they, that we know of? Or you know, they, I, I think Usenet, because it was a bunch of geeks, uh, actually got archived better than AOL did because AOL was more user level. Whereas Usenet, a lot of these guys were professional programmers. Right. There were not that many people on Usenet. It was a very small community. When you come right down to it, there was maybe what three or four hundred thousand people that were regular users, and the fact that I had seventy thousand people download my <laughs> manuscript tells you, you know, not that my manuscript was great. It just was novel. It was truly novel because there, nobody else had put a novel out there. So I think it just kind of piqued people's curiosity. It was a very small community. So we. Um we have a uh, what we call the post-apocalyptic uh, book club here at the workshop. <laughs> we, so we, we work our way through different books. And I mean, there's a ton out there now. But oh. you were you were kind of the the first, uh, you know, prepper fiction. What were your influences? I, well, well, I got yeah, to stop you right there. Sorry. Back I, was up. Not, I was not the first prepper fiction. The first okay. prepper fiction was written by a guy who's passed away. His name was Jerry Ahern. And he wrote a book yes. series called The Survivalist. Right. And eventually he wrote like 40 plus books. And they, they actually became kind of derivative mm -hmm. and repetitious. But he was the guy who really came up with the idea. And what I wrote, in a way, was sort of an homage to Jerry Ahern. So I don't take credit at all for be, being the first prepper or survivalist novelist. That had been done before quite successfully in the paperback genre. I was just the first one to do it as a shareware novel. Did you ever have, were there any other influences other than uh, Jerry Ahern in, on you, from, for from, you? Uh, I think Jerry Pornell. Right. Um, and uh, Jerry Pornell and Larry Niven wrote the book Lucifer's Hammer, which is an absolute oh, so good. survivalist classic. And I think that was actually more of a motivator for me even than Jerry Ahern. And I I had the privilege of corresponding back and forth with Jerry Pornell before he passed away. Uh, he was one of the writers for Mel Tappan's PS letter. I caught that. Uh, yeah. Um, and you'll notice that in the biography notes that I put up at the top of my blog, like I just had one for Reginald Bretner last week. Okay. He was a science fiction writer who also lived in southwestern Oregon, just like Mel Tappan. Mel Tappan kind of tapped into the writing community of southwestern Oregon, and he had several different science fiction writers like Dean Ng and Reginald Bretner, who wrote articles for his preparedness newsletter. It was called PS Letter. It was yes. only published for three years. Um, I actually found a hard copy set of it on eBay about 20 years ago, an original set, not photocopies, they, and the original oh, wow. yellow, pink, and blue paper they had for each year they changed the the paper stock they printed it on. I still have a binder set of that, but Mel Tappan, boy, he was an amazing guy. Uh, he he really 
motivated a lot of people, and he tapped into a real brain trust of folks who helped him write this newsletter. And again, it was called PS Letter. I think it's originally was supposed to stand for Personal Survival Letter, but because it had a lot of economics and had a lot on vehicles, they just left it as PS Letter because he wanted to have a broad audience. And then um, after he passed away, that newsletter was carried on for a couple more years uh, under a different title by a fascinating guy by the name of Carl Hess, who also lived in southwestern Oregon. Carl Hess was uh, a more of a political wonk. He was actually a speechwriter for the Nixon administration, who later became a radical libertarian, in fact, a, a, a quasi-socialist libertarian. Wow. Uh, Carl Hess ended up taking over the PS letter uh, because Nancy Tapp and his wife uh, didn't want to, to carry on with it. So that newsletter, I think, as well as the columns that that uh, Mel Tappan wrote for Guns and Ammo magazine and for he also wrote one for Soldier of Fortune magazine. He wrote uh, columns. I think those were some of the most influential writers in creating the those writings were the, the, the most influential in creating what we now know as the modern preparedness or survivalist or now they say prepper movement. The uh, the permanent bug out location was a or, or I get um, the concept of living at your bug out location. Yeah, that was Mel Tappan, big time. He was. Oh, I. Yeah, I, I I remember coming across a lot of his old Soldier of Fortune articles on, I think, BitTorrent, maybe many, many years ago, maybe 2003, 2005. And I was blown away. And I yeah, I picked up uh, Mel Tappan on guns recently. And I, yeah, I think. <laughs> Is that a yeah? Everyone should have a copy of both Tap It on Survival and uh, Survival Guns. Right. They're, they're just monumental books. And we really, uh, the whole community owes a debt of gratitude to him. And also for just his common sense. You know, he was not mm. some wild eyed lunatic. Uh, he was not, <laughs> I, I guess I shouldn't use wild eyed lunatic and Kurt Saxon in the same sentence because he's still. <laughs> I, heard he, I hear he's living in a rest home somewhere in Arkansas, but um, he wasn't really radical like Kurt Saxon when he was. Uh, Mel Tappan was very down to earth. Uh, he was an investment banker kind of guy by training, and but he he had real common sense, and he, that really carried through all of his writings. I really I've been trying to find as many of the kind of the original I, I call it not artifacts, but, you know, modern pieces of history. And I go around and speak at a lot of different prepping events. And uh, I kind of want to have this weird vision of kind of having this little traveling prepper museum, you know, just a table of artifacts people can come and look at and read through the old books. And it's fun. I don't know. It's because in the mo it's funny because we have we can touch any piece of information we ever want. But we also are very, very short minded and have short memories nowadays where we forget all of the people that built the steps we're standing on. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You can go all the way back to the nuclear war, you know, the fallout shelter era with writers like Pat Frank, who wrote Alas Babylon. Yes. Or um, uh, like, uh, gosh, there's so many. On the Beach? Yeah, On the Beach by Neville Chute. Uh, there's also a uh, a book by a Frenchman named René Barjavel who wrote a book called Ashes, Ashes. Oh. That was quite good. Um, and, uh, boy, Gordon Dixon, another science fiction writer, writer who wrote um, uh, a novel called Wolf and Iron. I think okay. that was also very influential as well. You know, folks should get copies of these and, and think think about – you know, where these the, the starting point that these authors came from, a lot of this was a, a original concepts that, that they generated. Um, you know, I look at a lot of what I wrote as standing on the shoulders of those original writers. I don't take a lot of credit myself. Uh, those writers really deserve all the credit.
I appreciate that. And it's absolutely true because what do they say? There's nothing new under the sun, you know, and uh, we, we just we reframe things to our generation and do the best we can, I think. So I, I don't want to keep you longer than the hour that uh, I promised you, but, and I could pick your brain on this for a long time, but I've got four or five questions from the community. Sure. Are you you cool for kind of a, yep. Okay. Before you do that, if if anybody wants to dig into Usenet. Yes. There's a site called groups.google.com. And between that and Wayback Machine, you can kind of piece together a very large portion of what went on in Usenet. It's really interesting. I it, The search functionality leaves a little to be desired, but I have discovered you can put in the word before colon and then your year, month, and date separated by dashes, and it will allow you to kind of eliminate a lot of the new stuff. Yeah. So that that helps. It, and it's good to have out there because who knows how long that stuff will be there. <laughs> Google will just be like, we don't need it anymore and it'll be gone, you know. Yep. But I uh, yeah. Uh, OK, what do we got here? So um, Dave on YouTube, he said, with the proliferation of new media sources, what are some of the most factual, regardless of political bent that you would follow today? Or are there any? Well, <laughs> in terms of fiction, I'd I consciously avoid reading other survival fiction because I don't want to subconsciously echo them in my own writings. Sure. I read a lot of survivalist fiction, but in terms of nonfiction, oh boy, uh, there's there's so many books out there. It, it's really hard to, to quali- uh, quantify them. Um, like David Nash's book, Basic Survival, for example, is a really good starting point. Anything written by Matt Stein, and unfortunately, Matt has passed away. Uh, he wrote the book called When Disaster Strikes, hmm. and um, he also wrote a book called When When Technology Fails. Okay. And he actually wrote a few pieces for my blog before he passed away. Uh, his his stuff is, is amazing, quite perspicacious. Wonderful. Um, um, so many books that are more detailed, like economics books. I would go back to a book from 40 years ago now. Uh, uh, that was um, The Alpha Strategy by John Pugsley. Okay. He was the first one who really recommended investing in tangibles and not just barterable tangibles, but e- tangibles you could eat. Um, so the alpha strategy and that book is available as a free ebook now as well. Uh, but there's so many great books out there uh, in the food storage arena. Uh, you've got books like passport to survival or making the best of basics. A lot of these books, by oh, the yes. way, are on my bookshelf page at survivalblog.com. And if you just go through my list there, um, I think you'll, you'll find a lot of really, really useful books. Uh, in the medical arena, um, anything written by uh, Nurse Amy and uh, Dr. Alton. Yes. Uh, they're just fantastic stuff. Uh, a lot of the early stuff uh, written uh, by uh, Patriot Nurse, for example, is um, she was originally more of a writer than she was a video commentator. And um, a lot of her original courseware is just absolutely chock full of useful tid- tidbits for people in the medical area. So, uh, and I could go on and on and on. There's, <laughs> there's books on on do-it-yourself communications. And uh, for example, I just in my blog, I just had a, a couple of different articles about digital communications over HF ham radio. Wow, there's so there's so much knowledge out there. And that's one of the great things about Survival Blog. The knowledge base that exists goes far, far beyond my own knowledge. I'm, I feel so just so I feel so much gratitude to hmm. people who've shared their knowledge over the years. Uh, I came, early on, I started running out of things of my own to post on my blog. So I came up with the idea of doing a writing contest. And then I had a lot of the advertisers on my site offer 
free merchandise or free courses for the pe- people that were, were doing training courses uh, as prizes for that writing contest. And now we're up to, I run it in bi-monthly rounds, we're up to round 108 of the writing contest. But so many of those articles have such a tremendous depth of detail and knowledge that goes far, far beyond my own. I'm, I really feel deep gratitude to all those writers. And I put all of the archives for Survival Blog available free. There's no members only area. It's all freely searchable. You can go back all the way back to 2005. And I posted almost daily. I wow. went a few days since 2005, right after my first wife passed. Oh, did we lose you, Jim? Five. There's over 32,000 articles and columns that are archived wow. there. Uh, it's all free for the taking. And for any of your listeners that are even mildly interested in preparedness, I suggest you dig in. But just don't start at 10 o'clock at night because you'll be up until 2 or 3 in the morning. <laughs> and there's a lot in those archives to dig through. I got it's one more. Open. Uh, so Scott from Instagram wants to know, do you have any new books in the works? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I have uh, my uh, Land of Promise series is on hold because things change so rapidly with ISIS uh, right after I published the first volume. I'm really waiting to see. I'm waiting for ISIS to pop up again. I think they will. And when sure. they do, I have two more manuscripts that are mostly written Uh, that I'll just have to bring up to date with with my uh, current events. And I'm also uh, working on a couple of anthologies out of the blog. One of the nice things about having the blog and its deep archives is I've got enough material. I could just do one whole book of just quotes. Uh, I I could do a whole book of just recipes. There's so much that's in those blog archives. I'll be anthologizing out of that blog probably for the next five or 10 years. And I never really intend to retire. I'll, I'll keep writing until I drop. I like hearing that. I mean, you know, not that, yeah, not that we expect you to drop anytime soon, but I love hearing people who do what they love and just want to keep doing it. I certainly do. I, again, I, I really feel blessed and uh, it's such a great community of people. Hmm. I, I get emails every day from folks and, The most gratifying ones are the folks that are now self-employed living in the boonies who really never even considered it until I suggested it 15, 20 years ago. And it's great to see so many people have made a lifestyle change out of this. I I appreciate you taking the time, Jim. This was fun. I, I it, it the hour flew like nobody's business. And if, if you're ever up for it again down the road, I would uh, totally love to have you back on Certainly in a few can. months. I would love to have you. I would love to be uh, back on if you'll have me. How uh, how can people? I, I know you've mentioned it, but again, <laughs> how do people follow up with you? How can they support you? That sort sure. of thing. Sure. Um, again, I, I'm the editor of Survival Blog. Dot com. It's just the way it sounds, all slammed together, survivalblog.com. And again, the, it's a free site. All the archives are freely available. Please, folks, dive in. And uh, print out the most important articles because you want to have a offline EMP-proof version. I do produce an archive stick every year uh, from the blog uh, that adds a year of blog posts and a whole bunch of bonus books. Uh, it's a, a waterproof USB stick that we produce each year. But you could essentially create your own archive uh, just by um, downloading articles and building your own database. Well, thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit the stop recording button here yet. Just don't hang up on me quite yet. <laughs> 